be covering 100 films through the history of cinema from A Trip to the Moon to Parasite and everything in between except Woody Allen. Fuck Woody Allen. Amen. <laughs> and that's all we have to say. Have a good yes. night. All right. That's the end Wait, of the episode. No, don't go. <laughs> Wait. Come back. And that's a wrap. <laughs> We made our one point. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point of the podcast. Mm -hmm. There's going to be 100 episodes of us just, you know, dissing Woody Allen. Yeah. And we'll be done. Um, Screw that guy. Yeah, really. Anyway. <laughs> not, not a good, not a good, not a good guy. <laughs> Today's episode is on Metropolis, and I am doing the report, and mm. I am nervous because I've never done one of these before. I believe in you. That's okay. We had never done one of these before. Mm -hmm. I feel more nervous about my second one than my first one. Oh. Which I was telling you about. Right. But Wait, it's true. who are you? Who's doing the report? Tell me <laughs> your name. Who is oh, this man? Uh, so I happen to be Reese. You are. Okay. Mm -hmm. I happen to be Hannah. I'm Hunter, I guess. I don't know. I feel like that's important sometimes, but maybe it's just... You know, I think that's for other podcasts, you know, like podcasts where, you know, the person matters. But, you know, we're just three, like amorphous blobs yeah we don't yeah. really matter we don't have personalities we're just like a collective group of nerddom yeah blob. we're like we're like voltron if the lions weren't lions and <laughs> they were just like gray sludge until they came together i don't get that reference and but <laughs> 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 i shouldn't be here Sad. i need to go <laughs> man you should definitely watch voltron <laughs> oh, it's okay fun. it's very fun hunters tried to get me to watch I've voltron it's been very hard like even with Hannah and Haven, our other sister, my and Hannah's other sister, not your sister, Reese, ah. uh, <laughs> as like fans <laughs> of like Avatar: The Last Airbender, to also try and get them into other like animated shows. It's rough. Haven actually is pretty good at that. Haven watched all of Samurai Jack with me. That's pretty cool. I appreciate that. That that is rad. But like, you li did you enjoy Korra at all? I have not fully watched Haven Korra. I'm a failure. Uh, I haven't watched all of it. I think but I've been seen watching it all or most of it recently. Now that it's on Netflix too, yeah. So I know getting there. Several people. It, I don't like it as much as Avatar. Avatar, but Fair. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people I like it more. Some maybe people present company in included. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't call me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know other what? people who also <laughs> like it more. So really, yeah. One of the guys that I like follow who does videos on YouTube, or like a friend of a guy who does those things, has said that he likes Cora more. So. Dang. So there's at least one other person out there. That's kind of nice. I don't know. I think even if you don't love Korra, I think Voltron is probably better than Korra from an objective standpoint. There's a little bit more there to be interested in, yeah. even if you don't like giant robots. But if you do like giant robots. If you like giant robots, we that's cool. We got some fun things for you. <laughs> I'm not super into giant robots, and I still like it, so... Speaking I'm of robots, slightly more into giant robots. robots. Oh my gosh, that is, is <gasps> oh such a good man. segue. I try. How Bring did you back do that? Around. I, I was practicing all night, honestly. I'm, it's okay. I'm impressed. Thank you. It's like writing in a notebook. <laughs> if they talk about Voltron, say this. <laughs> Got to be focused. <laughs> you know, it it would lead right into my summary, except that I do not mention the robot in my summary. Damn it, because Reese. I I did like a very early like. Oh, Non-spoiler summary of just like the very beginning of the movie. The There's no robot in Metropolis. I don't know what we're talking well, about. I mean, I really don't uh, think the robot is a spoiler since it's no, on the poster. It but is. I just didn't yeah. get there to explaining what the robot is. That's, That's fair. But it, we can get, I mean, who cares? It's, it's, we're good. It's, it's a movie from 1927. It's, like it's almost 100 years old. <laughs> it, it really almost is 100. <laughs> That's insane. That's so weird. When you look at it that That's way, really this movie weird, is actually. extremely impressive. And I mean, also, if you look at it other ways, it's impressive, but you know. I'm interested. Anyway, Metropolis, 1927, is a German expressionist film directed by Fritz Lang and co-written with his then-wife, Thea von Harbo. Mm. It was his 12th full-length feature film and proved to be his most well-known film, as well as being considered one of the very first feature-length science fiction films. Mm. There. That's just a brief oh, introduction okay. into... Um, why this film might matter i guess i don't I know it. there's yeah. there's some really interesting stuff that i want to get into with the writing team and also with it as being a part of science fiction because it's it's weird that one of the first science fiction films is like mostly futurist and also specifically german expressionist which mm. i was reading um basically kind of came out of like m being inspired by van gogh 
like it, hmm. it's directly kind of like expressionism wow. because the idea is like i guess as i was seeing to convey inner subjective experiences um and to not go for realism which was very popular at the time and to try to use dramatic visuals bright colors and a distorted sense of reality in order to, to produce produce more extreme emotional reactions in the viewer which is why the architecture everywhere in that movie is just so dramatic and honestly that's probably the most moving part of the film for me like the giant score like the sweeping score over just like the skyline is like the best part of that movie yeah um which is i don't know i just think that that's interesting that that's the earliest or one of the earliest science fiction features Mm -hmm. because it's still not quite what we think of as science fiction right there were still some like cliches in it too though like all the storytelling was all like oh i've been watching this storyline my whole life right yeah (laughs) yeah like it does has it kind of has like a a sci-fi version of like the doppelganger yes yeah trope and i don't know and just just the like here's the rich people and here's the workers and right dystopian it was like oh hunger games like the capital and the people in their weird clothes and then Mm -hmm. yeah we've been complaining about class disparity for a long time exactly yeah just that like (laughs) super contrast between the two groups Mm -hmm. yeah and you know at first i was like oh you know just it's just talking about class disparity and we'll get into this more um but as i started reading into it and reading more about the writers well not both writers but specifically fritz lang's wife Mm. um there's some nazi shit going on here guys Mm. not gonna lie one of hitler's favorite movies not not a good thing to set off this movie yeah that kind of made me appreciate this movie less Hmm. but there are some redemptive qualities that we will get into as well but you know i will i will say that out at the start there's some nazi shit going on here Mm. (laughs) Um, but the film is obviously pre Third Reich. It's pre, you know, National German Socialist German Workers. I don't remember mm-hmm. how Nationalist National German Socialist Worker. I don't know. It's a I party, know. you know, the Nazi guys. No. It's pre that. I'll trust. I had to read Mein Kampf in school, and I didn't get anything out of it. There wasn't really anything to get out of it other than wow, you know? yeah, Hitler sucks, and I had to read <laughs> seven hundred pages. <laughs> on top of just knowing about World War Two, to know that Hitler sucks. They wanted to make sure you knew. And I really do now. Other yeah, than the you are not a Nazi. Perhaps. I am very aware of how much Hitler sucks. So, you know, at least there's that. Good stuff. But, you know, maybe it makes it so I can enjoy Metropolis less. So. True. Probably an okay trade-off. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it in the end. <laughs> mm. uh, so I do have a plot summary here. Um, Let me see if it's legible. Uh, The film takes place in a futurist dystopia, the city of Metropolis. Uh, And I read somewhere that it takes place in 2026, but I didn't actually, I don't think I saw anything about that in the film itself. So I don't know where that came from. Yeah. I tried to find sources on that. I I couldn't find anything. Uh, But it's, yeah. The workers of the underground section of the city are forced to work these brutal shifts and keep the machines running specifically the heart machine is that what it was called I think it was yeah they mentioned it a few times yeah uh, yeah so. it didn't really you know it's early sci-fi bullshit so it doesn't like quite right. make sense it's what the heart <laughs> machine is clear, yeah what it is or i don't think you even see it until the end bit right yeah uh and then in the higher levels of the city the rich are playing in vast what, what are called eternal gardens unaware of the endless toil of their brothers and the the intertitle um in the film say uh about this as deep as lay the worker city below the earth, so high above it towered the complex known as the Club of the Suns with its lecture halls and libraries, its theaters and stadiums. Which is kind of good. I like that writing for some reason. It's got that just like really overly dramatic, fantastical vibe about yeah. it that I think is the reason why this film is still enjoyable. Uh, despite some issues. The son of the city master, Frieder, is brought to an awareness of the suffering of the lower class by Maria, who brings a group of children to the upper levels to view the opulence of the rich. Frieder feels compassion for those of the underground city and fights to resolve the class struggles, delivering a very upfront moral for the story that the epigraph delivers at the opening of the film. The mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart. 
Complete with a massive budget, brilliant set design, and engaging writing, Metropolis is quite possibly the most important film of German Expressionism and possibly the most enduring science fiction film of the silent era. Boom. There's the summary. Now yes. we know if we haven't watched it. Yeah. Shame on you for listening to this episode <laughs> and not watching the film beforehand. Or, yes. You know, or not. What if we're like the cheat sheet? We, I mean, that mm. kind of works. We're the Cliff's Notes. Like but we can be an unofficial podcast because we just talk about stuff. We can be the unofficial Cliff's Notes of <laughs> early movies. That's fine, I guess. But some of Perhaps. these, I think, are worth watching. Yes. Well, I mean, obviously. Right. That's kind of the point. It, it, I mean, it is. Yeah. You that's can fair. and should this watch these long. movies. Was long. Can and should. I would definitely at least recommend watching clips, or if yes, you haven't seen the true. movie and you're listening to this episode looking up images because mm-hmm. it's a very visual film and mm. even though the score is like really brilliant i think it's probably the visuals that like take the cake on yeah. why this film i mean like it's frieder's bewildered brilliant. look for me yeah oh yeah there's some <laughs> definitely constantly. very striking so visuals and like you were saying I, it made it kind of make sense when you were talking about like about what expressionism actually is because i was i hadn't totally connected that dot i guess but like thinking back on that makes sense like why things are the way they are because like mm. looking at all the way that the workers work with the machines is like there's no way that's doing anything practical a right. light turns on and you turn the thing so it points <laughs> to the light that's on and then the light goes off it's like what's that doing probably not anything realistic but <laughs> it gets the idea across of just menial labor over mm. and over again right for yeah. 10 hours totally. and yeah it, yeah, it's it's not it like that idea. the kind of work that it's not like Lang is visualizing like, oh, what would the future look like? Right. This is what work looks like in the future to keep machines running. It's like this is just a very obvious way to show it's uncomfortable doing menial labor for like 10 hours straight. Right. And it feels pointless. Yeah. But like you can't pick that up just specifically from like reading the text or something. If you were to for mm. some reason only read a a transcription of a silent film <laughs> but right. like just seeing yeah the visuals and performances that go along with those things are what sell the whole thing mm-hmm. so yes and i mean at one point when frieder like switches with i don't remember the guy's name one of the workers yeah. and starts doing that shift he like does scream out at like one point like father how long will this torment yes. last yes. or something it's like, like hell that. yeah it's <laughs> like this 10 hours so long i think you remember that yeah because yeah. you made it a quote on your first letterbox review oh movie. right <laughs> Yeah, I really liked that line the first time around, yeah, and I just cool. actually entirely missed it the second time. I don't know how. Like, you know, you got like five seconds on the intertitles. Like, you should be able to n- not miss a bit of dialogue, but yeah. somehow I did. So, <laughs> interesting. Uh, I feel like they definitely made it resemble hell. Yeah, sort they of they do depressing, yeah. dark down there. And with the like Lit-weird. weird, I don't know if they're like oh. dream sequences or yeah. whatever, but where it looks like that there's like cool. this giant like temple idol thing mm-hmm. i like that that was cool the, like hallucination vision thing yeah it's just yeah like because i tried to read it by right i mean that's probably another point of it like not being entirely literal but just being like look at this thing right it's just like the machine god that we feed human beings to and it's cool it's awesome I thought but it was cool. i think it it's funny because yeah you have to kind of have it framed as just being kind of a straight metaphor and mm-hmm. having that like mm-hmm. expressionism right. like processed in your mind right. when and you're they watching do, like, it. They deliberately like overlay right. the, like temple version over the actual one and go back. So mm-hmm. like it's yeah, it's very clear that it's kind of a, a different interpretation of that. Right. But I think with with more of the like like we we're talking about with the actual work that they're doing and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. it's really like if you are looking at it as like, ah, oh, this is an interpretation of the future and you're looking at it from the perspective of like sci-fi now, right. then it does seem just very upfront and obvious mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And surprisingly, that's actually kind of more what the perspective was at the time. Hmm. Like the, the critical reception to it when it first came out was, uh, well, H.G. Wells said the film was silly Uh, For example, uh, people just thought it was oversimplistic and didn't really have any depth to it. And that really hurt its reception. Hmm. Also, people thought it was too long 
and just just boring overall even though they were like oh well the visuals are incredible which right yeah i mean not only just the designs but we were talking about that before i think with the trip to the moon the way that like the matte paintings and melies like had smoke coming out of it and Mm -hmm. stuff like that and i i noticed things that are similar to that in metropolis but where you can't tell what's been added later mm-hmm. or how would that even yeah. would have been done like when you mm-hmm. see the skyline and they're like the right. trains going that's by and thought, the, planes. Yeah. the big wide shots of the the city yeah when there's just traffic moving i'm like that's that's pretty cool how the heck how did they do what? that yeah there <laughs> i was still don't know how there was like one shot towards the end i feel like and i'm not gonna remember where it was in the movie but it's like a highway and all these cars mm-hmm. are all jumbled up next to each other and mm-hmm. he's running down the road and it looked like yeah. just a weird picture they painted but he's running on the road and I'm like, how did they, I don't know. It looked so cool. It just, it was Very great. impressive, all of it, for sure. Yeah. I and then no idea how they did that. I think that was also the heart machine with, like, the electricity everywhere. Yeah. 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 The final act. Lots yes. of effects and stuff. Yeah. Like, when the, the robot had the scenes where there were, like, rings of light going up and down it. And mm-hmm. that whole machine scene. Like, it, it doesn't look bad no. even now. It like pretty good. You can see the strings on, like stuff in like the 70s and 80s yeah. but this but for some reason metropolis just kind of like holds up mm-hmm. kind of better which mm. is it's pretty great which is one reason why it's worth watching mm-hmm. uh but yeah no it, it definitely was not liked at the time and that led to as it would say at the beginning of the movie like at after the initial premiere it got cut like yeah. a bunch. It got cut down from the like 151 minutes that it originally was, or 153, to 116. And then when they released it in the U.S., it went down to 105. Whoa. So, Jeez. you know, about a quarter of the movie was just considered lost because after they didn't have that cut anymore, or if they did, nobody knew where it was. Mm-hmm. So the film was just totally lost, or, you know, most of it. And we so we had this version of it that just wasn't very good like just the the plot was nonsensical and yeah. i know like i have family members that watch that movie and were like that movie makes literally no sense and i asked them when did you watch it and they watched it well before we had the version that we do oh. now which is significantly yeah, longer like i think now our cut is up to like 149 right. what year did they say that that happened it was that like was the 2000s yeah right? 2009 or 10 yeah. i think is when they finally so found pretty um, recently yeah they found a 16 millimeter copy in Buenos Aires oh. that had about 95 percent of the film. Right. Like there's still a few bits that like they just have text that just t- tells you what happens. Right. Mm. I was surprised. I was expecting more of that honestly. Mm. And then there was really only that one scene, um, kind of in the middle-ish, second third-ish, or yeah, or last third. I there was that bit, but then there's also um, a scene in which apparently Joe Friederson is fighting with Raveng. And that, yeah. right, isn't yeah, shown either. I was thinking of, yeah. Okay. Well, there, there's another one earlier. Oh, I think okay. before that. So I think I there are two scenes. That was the only one I was remembering. Okay. I don't I, know. The other I one was really brief. One, though, yeah. It was like a shot or two. Yeah. So. But then there's lots of footage that's kind of got the like weird lines and mm-hmm. it's like not taking up the whole too. frame, which they prepared you for all of a sudden in the, in right. the opening. But yeah, there was quite a bit of that, but it was still good. Mm-hmm. I could tell it was happening. It didn't look as sharp as the rest of it, but. But you know, it's it's still functional, and sometimes it's like with the way that the score works it felt like weird that they could ever really cut it down because the music just kind of like never stops right Mm -hmm. and is so dramatic and flows into very specific scenes Mm -hmm. that the version of like when it would cut over to a 16 millimeter bit that didn't look very good it's like that but that amount of pacing is just so heavily required for the score and for the emotional impact of the scene that i don't know how they would have cut that and it worked which I guess it didn't. But uh, <laughs> in my sure. research, I saw that there are nine cuts of this Jeez. movie, which is insane. I don't I don't understand. Uh, and I came across, well, I guess not thinking of the short ones. There were two on Canopy. Yeah. So, you know, some of them are still available to be watched. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the original is lost. Uh, the, the 1927 edit from just like immediately after the film was screened, this 116 minute one, I think it's still around. Hmm. There was a 128 minute one for the UK. So I guess when they released it Weird. at the same time in the UK, it was longer in the US, it was shorter. And then hmm. the German version was in the middle. Interesting. So at the, 
So even in the first year of it being released, there were four different cuts. Oh, wait. No, I'm seeing here that there was another one in August of 1927 that was 118. There are so many cuts of this movie. Why? They came back in 1936 and cut it down to 91 minutes. And then there's this version in 84, which I think is probably the most interesting version, where uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. uh, Giorgio Moroder, I guess, was Mm -hmm. bidding for the rights to the movie. uh, And he outbid David Bowie for the rights Hmm. spent $200,000 on them in 84 and made a completely new uh, soundtrack cut the film down to how many minutes I think it was in the 80s cut it down to 83 minutes and made an entirely new very very 80s soundtrack that had (laughs) uh, (laughs) Pat Benatar and Freddie Mercury in it and uh, apparently it sucked it got it got two Raspberry Awards, <laughs> got worst original song, worst musical score. Nice. And for some reason was also nominated for a Grammy. So I, I don't I don't know how that works. Worst but, you song know. ever Grammy. Yeah, I that that should be a thing. Honestly, I that should no. be a thing. <laughs> some things that win best original song for oh. me should be worst original yes. song. Right. But you know, I've got weird opinions. Anyway, so that that bit was really interesting but it also makes me mad because david bowie could have done it and imagine if david bowie had come out with his own version of metropolis it'd be interesting i am pretty sure that would have been a five-star film it would have been longer than the original cut of the movie (laughs) i would have watched it though that sounds (laughs) so interesting if it was just like interspersed with just like random shots of david bowie from labyrinth i (laughs) i don't think i would care it would be fine (laughs) Uh, they and there you go. Starting in the seventies, they were trying to figure, like, find film archives and that kind of thing to mm-hmm. piece together the original cut of the movie. So there's a version from seventy two that attempted that. There's a version from eighty seven, another one from two thousand one, and then finally in two thousand ten is when they came out with the actual like semi complete version that we have now. Gotcha. Which I'm pretty sure having that extra info does help the film actually make sense which is nice but at the same time if i'm being honest it doesn't entirely do it for me Mm. anymore like the first time i saw it i loved it and the second time it it does just kind of feel very basic yeah it's 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 pretty simple Mm -hmm. i don't know it's interesting there's definitely good parts of it but yeah as a whole it's it's long and yeah, mm. it wasn't cliche in the moment, though. Probably, yeah. right? Well, I mean, sort yeah, of. it I wasn't. Mean, it wasn't considered cliche so much as simplistic, and now yes. it's become cliche, which right. shows that it does have a kind of power in of itself to be replicated so many times. Right. I mean, the robot design is mm-hmm. kind of the inspiration for C three PO. Okay. So it right. it definitely has its you know whatever it's tendrils in a lot Mm -hmm. of film so it it does i think still make sense to be on this list but for me it's just like it's a four-star film with a five-star score that that's my personal Mm -hmm. opinion that's deep gosh i don't want the hate i know i'm gonna get so many tweets about this honestly that's why i don't have twitter so don't even guess who has to deal with that you (laughs) me (laughs) all your hate tweets (laughs) (laughs) I'm just going to start saying the most outrageous things just so everybody sends tweets at you. Our only audience is going to be like Woody Allen fans. Oh man. I like hate. That's going to suck. Oh (laughs) gosh. Everybody's going to be like, why isn't Annie Hall on this list? Doesn't, doesn't Annie Hall belong on this list? Yeah, what the heck? As far as indie films go, (laughs) man, that movie I, I, no, I'm not going to talk about it. No, 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 we're focused. No, we're not going to derail. Instead, we're going to, um, let's see, what, what do we have? We could talk about the Nazis. Yay. The Nazis. Yeah. Tell so us much about fun. the Nazis. So, um, yeah, so Hitler saw it back no when it came deal. out. Thought it was pretty great. Kind of thought it was the best. Um, he went to go see it, apparently, with the Nazi propagandist, Joseph Goebbels, hmm. who apparently actually referenced it in a 1928 speech. I have the quote here. 
it, he says the political bourgeoisie is about to leave the stage of history in its place advance the oppressed producers of the head and hand the forces of labor to begin their historical mission oh my gosh oh boy which is kind of fucked ah! oh no so that's not fun fritz lang is definitely like as far as everything i've seen of him had no intentions towards that direction mm. of nazism yeah with his his movie he, that was not something he was thinking about at all but um his wife who was kind of more of the main writer on the film mm. eventually joined the nazi party nice. in 1933 Wonderful. where Fritz Lang was just like, I'm getting out of here. He divorced <laughs> her and then he left the country. <laughs> oh my God. So he clearly was not a Nazi himself. Uh, but his wife legitimately was. Which says a lot about the movie. Uh huh. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how Tricky. I feel about that. Uh, it, he was, uh, Fritz Lang was talking with uh, Peter Bogdanovich later uh, in an interview, wh- who's, by the way, the director of Paper Moon, which I think is on our 100 movies list. So we'll get to so. Peter Bogdanovich as well. But Fritz Lang said, the main thesis was Mrs. Von Harbo's. But I'm at least 50% responsible because I did it. I was not so politically minded in those days as I am now. You mm-hmm. cannot make a social conscious picture in which you say that the intermediary between the head and the brain is the heart, or the hand and the brain is the heart. He said, I mean, that's a fairy tale, definitely. But I was very interested in machines. <laughs> Anyway, I didn't like the picture. I thought it was silly and stupid then. (laughs) When I saw the astronauts, what else are they but part of a machine? It's very hard to talk about pictures. Should I say now I like Metropolis because something I've seen in my imagination comes true when I detested it after it was finished? Hmm. So he's very conflicted. I think a lot of just its connotations with Germany uh, during the war, (laughs) I think that's, that's a lot of the reason why he hates it. But apparently he also just, I mean, it is just kind of silly. Like H.G. Wells said that apparently Fritz Lang himself said that he just, it's kind of a got a fairy tale vibe, which is fine. Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. If it's not inspiring Hitler, then, you know. Right. Yeah, also, I don't, I don't think I mentioned that before, but Van Harbo ended up writing a bunch of Nazi propaganda films. Hmm. Oh That's boy. fun. Uh, huh. <laughs> I had I had no idea until I started writing this I report, and I really couldn't leave that out. You yeah, know? <laughs> didn't know any of this, actually. It's crazy. I, I feel like, even though that film, like, Metropolis is still very heavily talked about and respected, yeah. but it feels like nobody really talks about that ever. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I saw some reviews on Letterboxd that were like, apparently it was Hitler's favorite film. Clearly he didn't understand it. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> no, I think maybe... Did he? Maybe maybe he did understand it. And in that Whoa. case, do I like... Um, no. He was I like, oh, yes, this was made for me. I definitely feel uh. like I, I hear or I see it around more just like remaining influential because of the imagery. Mm-hmm. Like the robot yeah. image. Like the Fritz Lang bits. That's <laughs> hanging up in our Alamo draft house. Yeah. It's, it's so just cool. Like sitting up uh, by the ceiling. And I'm like, oh, it's cool. Like that's the thing that I see a lot, and I like. I did not know anything else about the content mm. of this movie that I I did not like pick that up from other cultural things. Gotcha. It was all fresh for me, but other than the imagery, a little bit. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, know, I thought I the ending was actually exciting. Like it kept mm-hmm. me interested. Yeah, like mm-hmm. cool for the most part through yeah. the whole thing. That's definitely the thing. Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess as he said there, he was just like, you know, I don't know about the plot or the themes or yeah. whatever. Yeah. But I like machines. Yay. <laughs> it looks cool. It was Which fun. Is fun to do. <laughs> the reason why it sticks around as a movie. Right. And I he's definitely proven to be a really interesting director. I have a few more movies of his that like I want to just briefly give shout outs to cuz they're great. But he's a very very good director who just happened to have a Nazi wife. Oops. Yep, it happens. It happens. <laughs> to happens to the best, the best of us. Of us. <laughs> Man. Um, but <laughs> Lang's other notable films, if anybody's interested, are M, which is a noir oh, film from 1931, yeah. which is, it is a talkie, and it's so good. I've seen it, and it's definitely one of the best crime thrillers that I've seen. And I've also heard a lot of things about The Testament of Dr. Mabuse. I've seen that. Really? I watched that for school in my, my film class that I keep mentioning. 
What did uh, you think? It's okay. It's fun. Um, I think it was connected to a bunch of other movies uh, at the time that I had not seen any of. Hmm. I guess that character. He's done a few movies with a lot that. of things. Yeah. Uh, but I saw that one specifically, and it's interesting. Hmm. I don't remember a ton about it. Did you like it better or worse than Metropolis? Maybe. I don't know. I like the sci-fi stuff and imagery of Metropolis. That's mm-hmm. probably more memorable. But I also feel like at the time, I, l- I liked Dr. Mabusa, too. I don't know. It's probably Metropolis. Gotcha. But, sorry. I, f- I forgot about that. I forgot that he did that. <laughs> that is <laughs> Carry really on. interesting. That's cool. I'm glad that I'm, you know. Yeah. I'm not the only one who is, like, really dived deep into Lang, you know, because I've mm-hmm. seen one other film other than Metropolis. Right. <laughs> yeah. I did it accidentally. But I definitely want to watch that one. Um, And then I've heard a lot of good things about Destiny Hmm. from 1921. So I guess that would probably be a silent picture as well, which is, as Letterboxd put it, a fantasy thriller. Hmm. I I really don't know much about that one, but I do hear that one talked about a decent amount. Cool. So I I am planning on seeing that one at some point. Um, And then I've also got some German expressionist films that are also probably worth a watch if the expressionism was the thing that made it land. Mm-hmm. But uh, let's see. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920 is considered one of the most important and best German Expressionist films. And I I think that one's on Criterion. I could be wrong. So that one is worth seeing. Obviously, 1922's Nosferatu, which is just also considered like an early horror classic. I still need to see that. Yes, I really want to see that, especially before, um, who's doing, is it Eggers that's doing a Nosferatu movie? Uh, yes, that is what I've heard. That's so exciting. Like, I think it, like, it's been on his docket, like, on his letterbox page for so long, but I think he's doing something else now before that, mm. but apparently it's happening. So it might oh. come out in 2022, sure. exactly 100 years after the first one, which would be really cool. That would cool. be cool. That'd be fun. Maybe that's the plan. I hope he pumps it out in time for that. That'd I'll watch cool. it. I'll watch anything that man makes. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> everything he does. I mean, he's only done two things, right, but, but I really but like pretty them. great. So, Hannah, watch The Witch. Come watch on. Watch The Witch. What are you doing? Please. Is it scary? Not kind really. of. Not really. Isn't it like know. a horror movie? Technically, yeah. Mm. I d- <laughs> but See, that's like the thing. I'm not really a horror movie person, <laughs> but I'm an Eggers person because his right. movies are not really horror movies. It's like not they're just kind of like You watched Hereditary, and it's like not oh my gosh. nearly that bad. If you watched Hereditary like and you survived. Kind of I barely no survived way. is the thing. It's like nothing. But The Witch doesn't do scary no. things. Is like that it has the one some with imagery the goats? in it that's kind of like, it does whoa. have the. It is the one with the goats, okay, but it doesn't I do creepy things. I watched the trailer, and it looked freaky. It's not that bad. I it's dark, I've seen it but it is freaky. Very old English-y. It's not that bad. It's good. It sucks now because now that I've watched Hereditary, everyone's like, oh, well, that's the worst of the worst. So you can watch right. this. And I'm exactly. like, no. But like, it's really <laughs> I regret every normal. life decision anyway. that brought me to watching Hereditary. <laughs> that one I can recommend. <laughs> st- I would still try and recommend that one. The Lighthouse is harder to recommend because it's just wild. I would watch it The Lighthouse, wild. actually. Really? Yeah. People so, refer to those acting okay. performances all well, they're the great. time. They're amazing. Yeah. That's but it's just a way I feel like you wouldn't like it lot. as much. You would probably more likely like The Witch. Yeah, I, feel like like I was really excited for The Lighthouse, but I prefer The Witch. The Witch is okay. probably my favorite movie that is technically under the category of horror. At least you Bye. can kind of make I'll sense of The Witch. I'll watch both in the morning. I mean, we'll I would love uh, to watch The Lighthouse. Patreon, you and if you, you really want to force Hannah to watch a bunch of horror movies... <laughs> You really could contribute to that. Shout us out Sponsor me, and I'll do like these horrible reaction videos where you can watch me like <laughs> freaking out. That, that would be great. Great. I, I want I'm such that. a pansy. Uh, I jump all the time at stuff like that too. So if I'll just be sitting there next to you and just, I, I guess that out. was a visual gag. So sorry. I was gonna yeah, say he's, are, he's yes. <laughs> he's joking. These are not jump scare movies. I like oh try to cover my eyes, but I don't want to miss anything. So I literally watch through my fingers like at five. <laughs> It's it's a good time. You can, that you can sounds watch like Robert a very good time. Be wild in anticipation of the Batman. Batman, which looks fun. Heck yeah! Actually, excited oh man, about that. that trailer looked interesting. I will see it, mostly because uh, I have belief in Matt Reeves, friend of the podcast, Luke. 
uh, saw that, and he has he's not into Batman. He fell asleep during Batman Begins. Really? And has never what? seen any other Batman film. Dang. Except maybe like no Lego longer Batman, makes me sad, podcast. but it's fine. Sorry, Luke. Uh, but he saw that, and he's <laughs> like, I saw the trailer for Emo Batman, and now I feel like I need to see other Batman stuff. Yes. Like, I mean, well, I've been times. telling you that for years, but it's fine. So maybe the Batman will make at least one new Batman fan. Probably Thanks, just Robert one because I feel like who isn't a Batman fan? I know. Other than friend, <laughs> there's Todd a lot Luke. of there's a lot of good Batman things. Oh, I told him he should watch Mask of the Phantasm with me mm. because I still really need to see that, and that's probably a good way to get into ease into that. I also I need guess, to see that because it's right there on Netflix, staring at me. Anyway, that's enough about that. What were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> uh, we were talking about German expressionist yeah. films, <laughs> but I think we watched. I think we talked about the, the important ones. Yes. Uh, so I have also some early science fiction films. There is a 1910 short adaptation of Shelley's Frankenstein hmm. that is worth the watch. It's like ten oh. minutes. Whoa! Uh, there's a 1925 adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, which Ew. is hmm. one of my favorite Doyle novels by far. It's really good. It, I don't really know how to explain it other than it. it's kind of got a journey to the center of the earth meets up yeah. vibe. Mm. Cool. It's rad. And I guess that's a full length movie. It's like 120 minutes or something. Nice. And then Lang has another film from 1929 called Woman in the Moon, which apparently introduced the idea of rocket launches counting down, mm. Whoa. which is kind of crazy because that's wow. an actual thing that exists now. That, that definitely happens sometimes. Where something appears in a in a sci-fi thing, and then real life just is like, well, they did it there, and now we actually kind of have that, so might as well. <laughs> it's so cool. I love that kind of thing. Why were people obsessed with the moon? I love that. I feel like I'm hearing all the movies and shorts back then, like refer to the moon or it's about the moon or something with the moon. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, like there was um, uh, what's the name of that guy? Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, who mm. there was a play about. Which is really good, and there's a play adaptation of that with James McAvoy. That will never which is see. Really good. Yeah, that came out in theaters, and I went to go Wait, see what's it. What's it called? Uh, it's, it's just called Cyrano de Bergerac, oh. but it's a National Theater Live oh, production. I see. It was really good, but it also, for some reason, nobody can ever watch it ever again because okay. National Theater Live puts their things for one night in a theater, and then they just disappear, and I hate it. Anyway. It's like real theater. Yeah, it is like real theater. It's so like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, it's like broadcasting so the effort into it. filming it. If we can't see okay, it. Okay, that's then, true. Then why not let me watch it again? Because yeah. I love it. <laughs> anyway, Cyrano de Bergerac is a play based on an actual guy who wrote a book about traveling to the moon. I don't remember the way that he gets to the moon, but mm. it, it felt. I we honestly should have mentioned it in a trip to the moon because it definitely feels like it has the same kind of ridiculous fantasy sci-fi vibe. But that was probably way earlier, like 1700s or something. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, the moon, a good topic. We yes. could do a whole episode on moon movies. There's a lot of them. Like David Bowie's son, Duncan Jones, who made a film called Moon. Indeed. I need to see that still. Me too. Watch moon Duncan movies. Jones movies with me, Reese. You should just do that. Please. Yes. Watch Warcraft with me. I, <laughs> I will. I'm just kidding. Watch Source Code with me. But also Moon. I because also I think Moon's will. probably his best one. I will watch all of Duncan Jones's movies, <laughs> even though I, I probably won't them. like them as much as I like no, his father's you music. Won't. Because, again, no. that would be impossible. You definitely will not. But, you know, I'll, do it. Like I'll do it anyway. So, also, as far as early sci fi films go, watch Moon by Duncan Jones. Yes. 2010? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with 2010. Uh, so, that's, that's a lot of stuff. That's some information on Metropolis. I hope any of that made sense. It did. Can we Do talk? We? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Can we talk <laughs> about like how dark Metropolis got for a minute? Mm. Like, I know it was from the 20s, so it wasn't that hard to watch. But all I kept thinking when I was watching the guy chase Maria around thinking she was hell was like, that was the name, right? Hell. What yeah. The other woman? Mm. Yeah. All I was thinking was like, if they made this today. I don't know. Those so those scenes I just felt like would have been like really deeply disturbing mm -hmm. if I was watching it in a more modern sense. Like yeah. it was kind of freaky. I was like, that's kind of disturbing. <laughs> yeah. And having that like kind of be somewhat intercut with, you know, people destroying their own city and not knowing where their children are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That and was setting someone on fire. Like, yeah. 
he literally and celebrating said and like holding Frieder back and laughing at him. Yeah, he's while like, he's watching. He thinks is he's watching his, right. you know, yeah. true love or whatever yeah. be yeah. burnt at the stake. It was pretty brutal at the end. And I was like, I can totally see them remaking this into like a really dark, disturbing film mm-hmm. today. Yeah, I'm surprised okay. that it hasn't. That's I don't true. think there is a remake. Yeah. I looked it up it's actually. It like really has not been touched. There is a remake into like a mini series mm. from the 80s. Weird. Of course they would do so that. So... Uh, I didn't really look into that, series. but I'm like, I want a movie released in the 20s now. Like, we'll do 2027 Metropolis remake. Leonardo DiCaprio can be Frieder. Good times. He just that's kept just, reminding me of Leo pick. DiCaprio. Yeah. You just don't get like, <laughs> like <laughs> stories like that. It was kind of cool. Hmm. Like, yeah. Just like, but like expressionism is like, I feel like that's not a thing in like mainstream entertainment really hmm. am i wrong but if we revisit it i mean now? I, yeah, kinda i feel isn't. like things are just much more generally not all the time but just i feel like a lot of things are more literal minded yeah i think things have definitely swung back in the way of realism mm-hmm. yeah. hence you know why we love our our indie masterpieces like lady right. bird and say yeah right right yeah totally so but what if you revisited it, would just it be now right with all it our technology now odd. But you and kept I some of the 1920s looks because the costumes yeah, and the right. makeup oh, were so heavily 1920s. Yeah, they like they cool. all just looked like flapper girls, like mm-hmm. the makeup and everything. Yeah. It was crazy. Like that would be so stunning to see recreated. Hmm. I would I really I like thinking. that. I would yeah, love cool. that. But that, yeah, that ending third act is just, is really dramatic. Yeah. And it's it a lot. can be very emotional if you're not really tired when you watch it for the <laughs> second time right or if before you're recording not an episode on politically aware of what's going on <laughs> if you don't if you aren't thinking oh about man. nazis <laughs> oh man <then laughs> but i think probably my favorite line comes in that third act where he's like where joe friederson's like where's my son and they're like just so you know Hell like yeah. hey hey buddy tomorrow a bu- lot of people are going to be asking <laughs> you where their son is yeah and he's like oh. right and that was pretty oh, no. good yeah i like that, that cool. bit yeah, there were like some good punches right at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't feel like. I don't know. The movie still doesn't like, quite straight read to me as being like weird and Nazi-ish. But yeah, I, I don't know, because it kind of isn't kind of the point of like, it, the you know the mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart being like. Maybe we don't have to tear down the entire system because maybe that ends up being really destructive. Right. Maybe we mm-hmm. try to like. Yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting peaceful. take. Like, I feel like I haven't heard that so much. I feel like things tend to either just tip in favor of one or the other, or like it is tipped towards the head and the hands get kind of beaten down. But like, I feel like the concept of yeah, somebody something in the middle hadn't occurred to me. But I don't. I'm not smart enough, and I haven't read enough to know if that's like something good or legitimate maybe that's maybe that's a bad thing i don't know who knows <laughs> who can say but it was an interesting idea yeah that i was i kind I of appreciated reader hops in and he's like what there's there's supposed to be a mediator it's me yeah, like, oh, I can right he it's just me. instantly like wait a minute <laughs> i'm the white male protagonist it is me yeah exactly he just like <laughs> chooses it i was like that was the most like male thing he could have done in the moment uh-huh. <laughs> it's me guys <laughs> uh, why wasn't maria the mediator yeah, i know right. that might have made sense great. She was too busy being harassed by men. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and being turned into a robot. Yeah. And that was fun. And getting free in a scene that we don't actually see. Yeah. I did like that her performance changed and made it very obvious which one was which. Yeah. She, she was just really good. I was very impressed with the two characters. And doing things with her face and mm-hmm. stuff. That but that line, changes. let's give the, what, man machine your face or something i was like oh, ah, yeah. what are they gonna do to her yeah i like that they always <laughs> call it the that machine man freaky. yeah <gasps> and if that oh. movie had been re- you know if they remake that movie mm-hmm. most likely they'll just rip off her face and exactly. stick it on there like, it more like violence thing that would happen mm. i have yeah. expected it that's what i thought the first time i watched the yeah. movie it's like oh right, so it was she's weird. dead now right yeah i thought she, she died again. it's like oh i thought she died she like slumps over in the chamber thing and i was like right. oh like did it like completely like move over but but i apparently not <laughs> I appreciate the scene where she's uh, running away from the freaky guy whose name escapes me. Rutving. <laughs> thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> I was like, I'm not even going to try to say it. And um, she like falls over the railing onto the bell rope. And she's yeah. just swinging forever. Yeah, yeah it was great. I'm curious how they got that shot because that looks like it, it might have been dangerous. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just a little. Mm-hmm. It was trippy. 
Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Good times. Poor Maria. I also poor Maria. Th- th- the thin man was a very imposing presence. I thought. Yeah. He's only in there mm. a few times, but like that guy, boy, he's got looks look. like a Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> Like, he, mm, I don't know. There was something about him that was just very distinctive. He's dressed in this way and, and holds himself in a way that just definitely feels like he's, like, some very, very creepy yeah. Nazi character he is from intimidating. a Tarantino movie yeah. <laughs> from the small little bit of Inglorious Bastards I've seen. And he sits. I, I should definitely actually watch that all the way through. Watch a Tarantino movie with me, Reese. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me out again. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel I mean, this one's a little more important. Quentin Tarantino man- matters a little bit more than Duncan Jones. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that's, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'll give you that. He's, he hopefully is, you know, he might be a little more weird of a person, but it's okay. I, I think I will enjoy a decent amount of Tarantino. They're fun. We are going to get to Pulp Fiction eventually on yes. here. It is yes. on there. I see that too. Uh, it's fun. It's wild. I'll do it. It'll be fine. We'll be, it'll be great. Yes. I've got, okay. I've got a <laughs> few last, a few last things. I've got a section on the budget. Oh yeah. I've got a section on the modern reception. I'll start with, I'll start with modern reception. Okay. It's got a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Ooh. Roger Ebert called it one of the greatest achievements of the silent era, a work so audacious in its vision and so angry in its message that it is, if anything, more powerful today than it was when it was made. Take that, H.G. Wells. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> it has a 4.2 on Letterbox, placing it at 107, 157 in the top 250 narrative films list, hmm. just above Kurosawa's Rashomon, which upsets me. <laughs> Lang's highest rated film on Letterbox is M, which is at a 4.3, sitting at number 80 at the moment. While Metropolis is not Lang's highest rated film on the site, it is definitely his most popular not just on Letterbox, but you know, across everything ever. Yeah, I for mean, sure. If it inspired Star Wars and it inspired everything else that has any kind of futurist look, which you know is like the design of Tomorrowland in Disney, and you know, I guess the movie Tomorrowland. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> seen it, and I will never see it. <laughs> and kind of The Incredibles, I feel like has some mm. futurist vibes in it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Right. Clearly through more influential than M. Definitely. In yeah. Like in I, I know things. I've, I've picked up things mm-hmm. about Metropolis. I have not picked up anything about M as far as I know. Fair. But I've heard about it. Definitely feels like it I led. M is kind of has a different sort of trajectory into the things that it led into. It's mm. more based off of like the plot structure. Yeah, that makes sense. That M has kind of contributed to. It definitely. M has a pretty direct line straight to Bong Joon-ho's Memories of Murder. Mm. Which is a good film that yeah. you should see. I do need to see that. I really Watch that see film. That. Yeah, that'll yeah. come out on Criterion I'm soon. Do it. Which is cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The budget was 5.3 Reichsmarks, which I did not know was oh. the currency at the time. Okay. Yep. Cool. Anyway, Reichsmarks, apparently 5.3 million Reichsmarks seems to be about 47.6 million of today's dollars when you adjust oh. for inflation. It's pretty good. So it was apparently the most expensive film made up to that point. Makes sense. There was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Like that last act, all the water and stuff yeah, going like they through had to those kind sets. Of destroy some of those sets. Like the yeah, sets how are did huge. They do the and like, yeah, the, it was just like, phew, it was really visually impressive. very impressive. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. It reportedly bombed, though, which is surprising because I don't feel like I've read anything else about that. But it here. pulled in 700,000 Reichsmarks, which is. Approximately 13% of its budget, or around $6.3 million today. Wow. <laughs> and the shooting took 17 months to complete. Oof. That's a lot. Jeez. 17 That's months? That's rough. Mm-hmm. Wow. Ah. And made no money. And made no money, and was kind of critically panned at the time, and was cut into different forms like eight <laughs> times after the original cut. <laughs> Oof. And was a Nazi movie. And yeah. was written Hitler by a freaking it. Nazi. Without people even realizing it. <sighs> Oops. There's some weird stuff about this film. But one more thing I want to note, which is a complete tangent. The opening shot with them like walking through the um, the halls, like all the workers walking through. Yes. Oh, that, like, yeah. giant. that reminds me of Pink Floyd's The Wall. Oh, yeah. Very strongly. 
a decent amount of this movie mm-hmm. reminds me of Pink Floyd's The Wall. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see a that. good thing. I like that thing. It's good. Anyway, so it's got a bunch of in- it. It influenced a bunch of things, and um, I don't know. I think that's probably everything I have in this report. Not very structured. I like this report. It Perfect. Was cool beans. Do we want to go through our personal feelings a little bit more? Mm. Starting with know. Hannah. Hello, I'm Hannah. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'd give it a four star also. Because mm-hmm. I liked looking at it. I liked the ending. There was a lot going on for a silent film. Mm-hmm. They chose to run with like some fairly complex... Like, I know it was simplistic, but also they had an actress play, like, two characters. And I'm like, yeah. go you. Like, you right. didn't even have dialogue. And you, like, pulled this off. And it was totally noticeable. Like, it worked. Um, so, yeah, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I didn't really resonate with it like the other ones, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of felt the same way. Like, it was cool seeing just the visuals effects stuff and some interesting stuff in the story and it was all good but it w- I did feel the length on this one more than <laughs> some like I don't know maybe that's just me it is definitely Probably an is hour longer like yeah than the previous movie like yeah I, I hate to like agree with the sentiment of the time perhaps and I don't know I don't think I would watch a shorter version because I don't know what I would remove exactly mm-hmm. but it I don't know it kind of feels a little long but I it was think good. there were I shots four that were well. a little long. Like, yeah. you saw those guys walking through halls for quite That's some true. time. It's yeah. like, do I need to see them still That's walking? But yeah, no. It's, <laughs> it's all right. You could do a lot worse, obviously. <laughs> so, Yeah, I will agree. I think probably most of what's there I wouldn't remove. But at the same time, definitely on the second watch, it did feel long. It felt long on the first watch. Mm-hmm. I think... It just it, it's one of those movies that just feels long, even if it does kind of make up for it by right. it but being like used for something. You can be two and a half hours or more and not feel long. True. They're out there. You can be and three hours long and f- not feel long. Yeah, like exactly. Like Seven Samurai. Yeah. Which I'm very excited to get into eventually. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. I really wish the 100 films list was just Man. 31 Kurosawa movies. <laughs> And, <laughs> uh, and Ryan Gosling it. movies. Yes, and all of the rest of them, Ryan Gosling movies. Mm. You thought I forgot to plug that in. <laughs> I really did. Yeah. I'm here. Every time. I'm always <laughs> here. Here I am. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think I'd probably also give it a four. I really, really liked it the first time. I was reading a lot of Dickens when mm. I first watched it, which made sense in my brain for some reason because... Dickens's response to like I don't know the social critique of like classism and whatever was to be like ah what we really need is to have those rich people take care of the poor and be really nice which is kind of Mm -hmm. what it feels like Metropolis is doing it's not like we need to fix the structure it's kind of like ah if if the if the head and the hands are getting along and we're being nice and buddies then everything will be fine right so in that sense it at the time it was like really interesting to me because it felt like it was is tying into stuff that i was reading yeah Mm. but just watching it now to talk about it here it visually very impressive and i still think that the score which i don't think we talked about too much already on the podcast i think i have the name of of the guy who did the score but that is one of my all-time favorite film scores i think it it just has so much it definitely feels like it it vibes with the expressionism yeah. it's so much more dramatic bombastic and is almost kind of a storytelling device way more than what we saw with the general which i guess makes sense because that wasn't an actually written score but even comparing it to other films of the time like Tra- chaplin films which by the way charlie chaplin not only wrote starred and directed his films he also scored them and hmm. produced them nice. that's talent that's a lot of talent anyway the score for this movie <laughs> is the best, probably my favorite thing of the 20s, probably my favorite thing of just early films or silent films. Ah, the name, Gottfried Huppertz. Hmm. Probably didn't pronounce that right. It's a German name. Nice. But yeah, the Gottfried score is the best Gottfried. thing. Gottfried. 
God, yeah. Gottfried. Gottfried. I don't know. I'm yeah. just making stuff Something up. Something like that. <laughs> he wins best score. Good 1927 job. Academy Award for best score. I, I don't think it actually won that. I don't think the Academy Awards were around. I, I don't know. But I would give it that posthumously because he's now dead. Right. What? I bet he would appreciate that. Well, I mean, he, he scored this in 1927. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That was, he that definitely was, does. Very sarcastic. What? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, I that's the best part. The visuals are really good. I like a, a futurist aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I, in general, like sci-fi. I like a more fantasy-esque sci-fi, which this kind of gets a little bit, but doesn't quite nail it to the extent that A Trip to the Moon does for me. It's a four-star, yeah. probably my least favorite film that we've covered so far. Same. But I still think it deserves to be on this list because it's yeah. mm -hmm. clearly I very agree. influential. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, there we go. That's Metropolis. That's the film. Now, uh, uh, speaking of segues, does anybody have a segue to segue out of this segue segue? You know, I like to segue uh, into the best uh, dialogue or quotes from the movie. Ooh, hmm. I thought yeah. of one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you, you know, <laughs> that that's a good Wait. segue. Um, mm. Do you have, have anybody have any quotes from uh, Mall Cop? <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, speaking speaking of segways, oh, he segways. Rides one. yeah, oh, ha -ha, ah. ha -ha. oh man, that was so good, much fun. Um, mm. Okay, wait. So if we're actually gonna wrap it up, then I suppose there are a few things that we should say first. Um, I guess there's a, th a thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. If you want to send us an email, we're at Movie Overload Pod. Email us. We're lonely. At Gmail. We're also on Twitter at movie overload pod underscore yes and then on instagram is movie overload pod don't give me your hate tweets no hate tweets i don't want them <laughs> uh, I want if your you want to tweet me about it directly <laughs> you can you just have to find my twitter account which currently doesn't exist so screw mm. you so ha Fuck jokes Woody on Allen. you <laughs> ha, you can't do anything about it <laughs> ha. Uh, there's also a form on our website movieoverloadpod.com in which you can interact with us yeah. and we have the full archive we're available on all the platforms uh maybe someday we'll have a patreon that could be cool i'll plug <laughs> that in advance sponsor you me check you should if put we out have a patreon first. on our website if as you're listening recording. to this later <laughs> than when it releases yeah we'll upload say, as of recording this we don't we'll even have an yeah. episode on the internet yet but right. we will we will have several by the time this actually right by up, the time this obviously. releases we will have recorded uh Oh gosh, a lot. like ten episodes. Yeah, so we are banking them. We uh, are sorry, I guess. You know, because <laughs> we know we you really wanted know. a timely podcast from I'm us. Sorry for me. You really wanted yeah. some insightful political discussions, and and really talking about the way that films respond to current political events. And I'm sorry that we can't do that for you by talking about in talking about. 1930s movies, I guess. I don't know. We, we could. I feel like some of this stuff is sort of relevant. It, it is. Yeah. Metropolis has some we stuff could. that is semi-relevant yeah. to now. We could. But also, this is evergreen content. What are you looking for? You, you fool. I mean, if, I mean, if it was relevant fool. then, you fool almost a hundred years ago, maybe it's just always going to be relevant. I think so. I don't know until we actually fix the problem. Who knows what problem that Please. is? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know what you're referring to. I don't have a political bone in my body. <laughs> so okay. I, I okay. have no it's clue fine. what you're talking about. I don't know. I, I, don't I thought that you hated Nazis. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll take a political <laughs> stance. God. I just I don't, don't like, like Nazis. Nazis. That's about it. <laughs> that should not be up for debate. I mean, we are we are an anti-Nazi no, prop. Uh, prop? Heck, huh. maybe it is. Podcast. We don't like Nazis. Yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. That's we'll it. just take that's a stance. We if we can collectively <laughs> just say that right now at the beginning, at the uh, at the beginning of the podcast, at the end of the third episode, we don't like Nazis the here. Officially, that's if you're a Nazi, so we're clear. this is not the podcast yeah, for you. Exactly. Find this something is else. Not Turn the podcast it off for you. Now. Oh. <laughs> um, yes. Anyway, so that's that's our that's our stance, Ooh. and uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And as we say at the end of every episode of Movie Overload podcast. I just wanted, I just wanted to shout out my boy Frieder, Joe Friederson's son. 
because I thought that was really funny. It really sucks. That's not not a good naming scheme. <laughs> <laughs> they say it several times, and I like it. But like, Just like you, Frito, Joe you Frito never lost son. track like of who what? those people were. <laughs> yeah, somehow. <laughs> but somehow. I just like the way all those words flow together. Just Frederson's son. She sure is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. Why isn't it? It could be the other way around, right? Yeah, that actually like, makes more sense. Why wouldn't like Joe Frederson just be Frieder, and then? the protagonist would be Friederson. That's true. Because then it's like, ah, Friederson. I don't right. know. Go ask what's name. Anyway, thank you for this terrible conundrum. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will never be That was the only thing I could think of. I can't I was, sleep like, at night now. That stuck, that stood out to me. Everything sucks now. Oh, man. Thanks. It's okay. Goodbye, people. Goodbye. Goodbye.